so my name is Daniel. Um, I'm part of Clovis North. Um, and this is the Design for Assistive Technology um, speaker events. Today we have Jin. And basically what assistive technology, Design for Assistive Technology is, is a multi-school collaboration to build assistive technology for those in our local community. So we have schools from Virginia, from New York, and California here. And um, yeah, thanks for showing interest. And Jen, if you want to introduce yourself and take it away. Sounds good. Thank you, Daniel. So hi, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you all. Thank you for coming. Um, um, and uh, so um, I'm going to just briefly introduce myself. Um, I'm an instructor at MIT, um, teaching a couple courses on in engineering leadership. Um, I've been fascinated with uh, using technology to help people with different types of disabilities for quite a long time. Um, I started out in sort of um, a space where I was helping people um, who are blind or visually impaired, and I moved on to other technologies such as autism, um, you know, Alzheimer's patients, and uh, some of the other related uh, brain disorders. And then I moved on to looking more at inside the brain to see if we can help solve some of the problems better um, instead of just using you know, technology to try and uh, enhance people's lives. Or what are some of the root causes and can we actually address some of the problems in the brain? So I started to uh, go down more that path uh, in the recent years. Um, it's definitely a journey and venture. And today I'll be sharing about one of the startups that I worked on um, quite a few years ago, uh, perhaps one of my first or earliest attempts at looking at assistive technologies. So let me just go ahead and share my screen and let me know if you guys can see this. Can you guys see my screen? Awesome. Great. So, um, so today, oh, it's cut off for some reason. Let me try that again. Okay. Hmm, still cut off. Well, hopefully it won't hinder very much. We'll, we'll see if you guys can't see text for some reason, please let me know. But let me know if you guys can still see my screen. Yep, all right. So, um, I'm going to start out with a story of uh, how I got into this whole thing. So I like learning languages. So um, a few years back, out of curiosity, I ordered a Braille version of the Bible just to see what that's like. Um, and uh, I, I used to read the Bible in different languages. Um, and um, I, I came across this ad while scrolling through Facebook one day and said, oh, hey, would you like to learn Braille? We can ship you a Braille version of the Bible. And the way that they described it was intriguing to me. Um, they said, well, make sure you have an entire empty bookshelf and make sure that you're prepared for multiple shipments. And I was like, OK, what does that really mean? So out of curiosity, I ordered this. And what arrived at my doorstep over the next few years, I mean years, were basically boxes and boxes, each containing a segment of the Bible. So for example, the book of Psalms is like 150 chapters. And that came in four booklets, each of them pretty thick, about the size of your textbook. And four of, four of them all together would actually give you the book of Psalms. So what came to me over the next few years were basically what is what can fill up an entire bookshelf, as you can see on the picture on the left side here. And that was one book, just the Bible. So that came as a real shock to me. I was like, well, how do people who are blind really learn to read? Because I mean, every single book is gonna take up an entire bookshelf. And guess how much this cost me? Any guesses? Two hundred dollars. Two hundred. Any other guesses? I guess uh, easily above a thousand. A thousand. Okay. Yeah, this actually cost me um, eight hundred dollars. So somewhere in between the two of your guesses. So one book 
takes up an entire bookshelf and costs $800. Now, imagine if you want to get an education as a person who is visually impaired. I was like, wow, this is going to take quite a while and it's going to cost quite a bit. And uh, what I realized later on, what, what I didn't know at the time was each of these dots, when you press down on them, it sort of you know compresses the dot a little bit, right? So if you read the book a number of times, say four times, the dots are compressed enough by then, they're squished enough that it actually compromises the readability. So later on, if you want to read this book again, it might be better to purchase a new book after reading it maybe four times. So I was like, this is absolutely ridiculous. So I was like, well, there's got to be a better way for people who are blind to get an education. So I started down this road um, a few years back of looking at what are there, what are other solutions that are out there. So uh, at the time, my background is in engineering. And what I did was I built a very quick prototype of um, six dots, six braille dots. And I basically said, okay, easy done. I can just send any piece of text over to these six um, things that are known as solenoids. What they, they basically are are magnets that can be turned on and off um, by using a program. So I can control each of these dots individually and then together, if I were to send over a long string of text, um, what happens is uh, these dots would turn on and off based on the letters. I was like, okay, easy done. I can just you know turn any book into an ebook and then convert all the dots over to this thing, and then the person can put their finger on it, and uh, there we go. They can now read without having tons and tons of books. Now, why do you think this didn't work? Any guesses? Is it because they couldn't differentiate the words as much? Um, so people who are blind are usually like very good braille readers. Like they can read like 300 words per minute. Um, and you know, you or I as a sighted person can usually read at that speed, normal speed as well with uh, just words. So they can actually read extremely well. And so um, distinguishing the dots isn't as much of an issue, but there is some underlying, you're getting somewhere with that um, comment. And any other guesses? You guys are quiet. So what, what ends up happening is, um, do you guys ever listen to your teacher in class and halfway through you're, you start thinking about that bike ride on Saturday or what you have planned for the weekend and your mind just drifts off to somewhere else and then you pull back and you're like, oh no, the teacher went on to talk about something else and now I have no idea what the, what's going on. So the same thing happens to everyone, like our minds drift off. And what happens is that like, usually if you put your finger on just six dots without moving, you tend to tune out. It's like you're listening to the radio, you tune out. If you're reading a book, sometimes you tune out. So if all you have is six dots, you tune out. But if you were to actively move your fingers across an entire line of dots, then there's much less chance of tuning out because you're actively engaged in the reading. So the feedback I got from the blind community was, this looks nice, but it doesn't work because we're going to tune out very, very easily. Um, you need your brain to be actively engaged in the reading. So I was like, okay, fine. Why don't I just get a line of dots instead? And so I went out, I did more research. And what I found was actually this device already exists. There are people out there using these braille e-readers and it's basically a, a line of dots. So they already exist. But what's the problem here? Any guesses? Was it too expensive to like manufacture for everybody? Yep, it was absolutely way too expensive. Any guesses on prices? Don't be shy. <laughs> $800. Okay, I got 800 from Daniel. Any other guesses? 1200 1200 okay 3000 3000 
Yep, you guys are getting closer and closer. So this particular device actually was like somewhere on the range of about $5,000. And on top of that, you can't get water on it. You can't get moisture on it. If you break it, you know, you got to buy a new one sort of thing. So most people who are blind actually can't afford one of these devices. Um, and part of the reason why they're so expensive is because each of the individual dots. Uh, so if you were to zoom in, like this is a, a very quick prototype I created, right? Like each of these dots, if you were to make a miniature um, such that it, it's actually like the standard size for Braille and actually like manufacture it, like each of these dots are actually hundreds of dollars, which means that if you multiply that by the number of, sorry, each of the cells with like six or eight dots is actually like, um, a couple hundred dollars. So if you were to multiply that by a whole rain, um, whole array of like dots, that gives you a cost of a few thousand dollars, depending on how many dots you have. And the more dots you have, the more you can read. Um, so imagine if you were to only have four dots, that's the equivalent of reading an entire book four letters at a time. And every time you want to read four more letters, you want you need to press a button or something or to for the screen to refresh and to get four more letters. So that, as you can imagine, will probably be very frustrating. But if you have more dots, then that increases the readability of people. And that also at the same time increases the cost. So as you can see, there's clearly a trade off between cost and readability. So I was like, okay, what do you do then? So this is Paul Paravano. Um, he works here at MIT um, and he has been blind since, since the age of three, I believe, uh, due to an illness that took away his eyesight. So he showed his first braille um, sort of learning device that his parents gave him when he was a kid, where he was stick in like little um, pegs so that he can learn all the letters when he was like a toddler and then his current braille device. And then I went over to a few other places, um, Perkins School for the Blind, for example, just to see what their students use. And sure enough, they use similar uh, Braille e-readers. They also have these um, giant buttons on top so you can actually type in inputs if you want to. So it's kind of like a keyboard, but um, because Braille has eight dots, you would just input like these eight buttons instead of having a standard keyboard. So got a little bit fancy, but you know, it's basically an e-reader. And again, this is like on the, uh, this was like somewhere around the range of like $8,000 or something like that. And then I also got to um, tour a plant, a manufacturing plant where they were printing out physical braille books. And I got to see what that was like. And it's a very tedious process and very, very expensive. Um, and then I got to really look at people who are newly blind. So there are two types of um, visually impaired populations. One is people who have been blind since either birth or early age. So they're already used to being blind. Their whole life they've been blind. And then there are folks that became blind later in life due to like car accidents, diabetes, or some kind of sickness later in life. These are usually people in their 60s or above. And a lot of times um, learning braille is like much harder by that age. And a lot of times um, it actually takes a year for them to actually learn braille, even though it's just like 26 letters of the alphabet. And part of that reason is because people actually get really depressed because they lose their eyesight. So they don't have that motivation to learn. And by learning braille, it really is sort of like saying, oh, I'm, uh, I'm accepting the fact that I'm, I'm blind now. And a lot of them could be in denial still and don't really wanna face that reality. So it actually takes them longer to learn Braille compared to, um, you know, like if I were to learn Braille just out of curiosity, because I think it's a cool thing to learn or something. But for them, it's like, this is what they need to go on with life. And then there are also audio devices out there that I saw um, one of my mentors who is blind uh, uses one of these and it just like plays sound. Um, so you can actually navigate a smartphone entirely through sound, which is actually pretty interesting. So 
um, some of you might be thinking, okay, why not just have like audiobooks for everything? Or like have your smartphone or your computer just like read everything out loud? Because that seems to be like a new trend, right? Like, why not just do that? Any guesses why we still need Braille? Why is it important to have Braille? Because is that an audiobook for everything? Yeah, so audiobooks may be limited. Yep, we don't have audio versions of everything. Um, any other guesses? I don't know. Personally, I don't like audiobooks. I like holding the physical books. I don't know if people who are blind also like holding the physical book. Yeah, there could be that preference. You know, I prefer touching the letters versus like hearing things said out loud. Any other guesses? Um, people with visual and hearing impairments might need Braille. That's true. Yeah. So these are good reasons, but there are also other reasons why people don't use um, audio or like still need Braille. For one thing, uh, bathrooms, when you go to a bathroom, uh, there is no audio that says you are in the woman's bathroom or the men's bathroom. You, you really have to feel the letters on the door in order to know that you're going to even the right bathroom. Um, same with elevators and some other things. Um, so that's one thing. But the, uh, there are numerous other reasons. So here's a comparison of all the different uh, things that are available to people who are blind. So there are physical braille books. And I mentioned, you know, it takes up entire bookshelves for like uh, one book or like two books, sometimes depending on how thick the book is. The cost is tremendously high. It's not very accessible to people. Uh, there are also environmental concerns because you're using up a lot of paper. Uh, production might be an issue. Also, even the moisture in the air can affect the reading quality. Um, when I was talking to people who have been, uh, have been blind their whole life, they're like, yeah, if I go to a different environment and there's too much moisture in the air or too little moisture in the air, then the book isn't very easy to read. So um, that really plays a factor in it. And then wear and tear. So if you read the book more than four times, a lot of times that book is pretty much useless. And you have to get it. Well, like it's much harder to read. So it's much better to have a new book at that point. So there are obviously a lot of um, issues with physical books. So people are like, okay, why don't we go to e-readers? And we've talked about how they're really expensive. Nowadays, we're starting to see some under $1,000 e-readers out there, but they're still rare and we're still developing them. A lot of them are in the few thousand dollar range. They're not very portable. And um, I talked about how you need more letters in order to for the reading to be uh, easy enough, but that also means more cost. Um, and so people are like, okay, well, what about audio? That seems like a better alternative. So there are a few concerns with audio and you guys mentioned some, but also musical notations and math are gonna be real hard. I imagine solving all your equations by only reading them out loud and then saying, okay, I'm gonna solve this equation. Try that as an exercise and see how that goes. Not very well. So touching the, the numbers in, in the equation sometimes helps a lot. Same with musical notations, um, especially if you're playing the piano or something. Um, and then if you're multitasking, so imagine you're talking to someone on the phone at the same time, you're trying to read a piece of information to that person and you have to use audio to do so. Uh, now you got two competing audios in two different years. One, you know, the person on the phone and the other is the audio you're trying to read out loud. And it's just, competing information. Um, so I don't know about you, but I can't listen to two pieces of audio at the same time. Um, and then there's also privacy, right? Like, let's say you're sitting on the train and you're trying to read an email out loud. If you don't have headphones or something like that, then it might be a real concern. Um, similarly, like even for things like time, recently a friend of mine actually developed a watch that you can touch. For the visually impaired, before that, watches were like speak out loud watches where you press a button and it actually tells you the time out loud. So um, I remember there was one guy that was visually impaired in class and he wanted to know what time it is. And he, he would always whisper to his friend and go like, hey, what time is it? Because if he were to press that button, 
in class, everyone hears. And so it, it just, it, like, it, it's a real concern for him, right? Like, just because you want to know what time it is while in class, you know, everyone else has to hear that as well. So there are some issues with audio as well. Um, so having said all that, uh, in terms of figures, there are about 285 million people worldwide who are visually impaired. About 74, of, 74 million of these are in the US and about 90% of them come from low-income families, meaning that uh, a lot of these options are actually really expensive for them, especially since a lot of them come from developing countries um, where you know, this is just in, impractical for them to, to work with. So what that really means is that a lot of them are just not getting educated and not um, going on to employment. And speaking of employment, even in the U.S., which is what I would consider us to have to be a fairly, you know, wealthy country compared to the rest of the world, even in the U.S., only 26 percent of people who are visually impaired are employed. And another reason why Braille is still needed is that most of the people who are employed are actually Braille readers versus people who um, rely mostly on audio audio so you can see from this chart here that we really need a better solution out there um, something where you know something that's cost effective user friendly and um, helps with things like privacy and other things in order for people to really have an education and later on become employed as well so what do we do there so, um, well, there are uh, solutions out there that people start, are starting to come up with, which aren't ideal per se. So for example, a Korean company called The Dot actually came up with this watch that allows people to have, um, I think this is a $300 watch to be able to read braille. But as you can see, it only has four braille letters um, so imagine reading an a entire book four letters at a time, not very user friendly. So, I mean, they had some initial buzz, but sort of faded over time. And then um, I was talking about how musical notations and equations. So imagine reading this entire equation uh, out loud and then trying to solve that. Not very friendly, but if you were to have braille dots, um, it's a lot easier. So uh, as you can see, there needs to be a solution that can really look at all these different pros and cons and be able to extract the best pros out of these. So what do we do? So I came up with this new solution. Um, it's basically, a, it, it's still a braille e-reader, but instead of having a, a whole line of dots that's gonna be really costly, um, we basically wrapped it around in a circle which means A, it's, there are fewer dots that are needed, but B, at the same time, it doesn't really compromise on the readability because if you were to roll this ring on a flat surface, you can have essentially um, as many letters as your arms are, your arm can, can stretch to. So what that really means is that this could potentially reduce the cost because the cost really depends on the number of dots. So we're reducing the number of dots without compromising on the readability that people experience. So this was the solution that my team uh, started to develop. And so we, we took it to people who are blind. We asked them for, you know, what do you think of the solution? And people loved it. And people were like, oh, you know, when is it coming out kind of thing? So we were really targeting for this to be under $500 compared to the thousands of dollars that um, all these other products have. Uh, but at the same time, we also want it to be effective. So the more dots you have, the more effective it becomes. Um, and we're basically arguing you can have as many dots as you want with uh, this device uh, or up to the length of your arm. So it, it scores high in terms of affordability as well as effectiveness. Um, so we started out by doing a lot of prototyping in terms of um, 
the magnets or the solenoids that can be turned on and off. Um, and then we started to do lookalike prototypes um, to really figure out how well this could work. Uh, we start working with LEDs because they're cheaper to work with than, um, than the solenoids. And then we start to really map out the dimensions. What's interesting about people who are blind is that the, the dot size, as well as the spacing between the dots, as well as the spacing between the cells, are extremely precise. If you're off by even a tiny bit, it, it totally changes how they read Braille and, and uh, it really messes up the way they read Braille, especially people who are born blind and have been reading Braille all their lives. So it's very, very precise in terms of how much space, um, what the, the specifications are for each of the cells. And so we started to look at ring sizes, uh, you know, for different people and different size hands and fingers and how many cells we can fit into it. Um, and then our team started to really work out a prototype. So, and we also did some reverse engineering on some other products just to see how they worked on the Braille dots um, and also built giant prototypes and printed out circuit boards. Um, so this, uh, unfortunately, what ended up happening was we ran out of funding before we could complete the uh, functional prototype. So unfortunately, to this day, we don't have um, a working product that is ready to sell yet. Um, and there are some lessons that we walked away learning. Uh, so one of the things about assistive tech, and you guys will um, probably run into similar challenges, is that uh because the market is so niche there are very few people per segment a lot of times investors are very hesitant to raise funds and and to really um try to um really really try to invest into your um company because uh, so when I was pitching to investors, what was happening was I was saying numbers like, oh, 74 million people uh, in the US and 285 worldwide. Um, and they were like, those are small numbers. And how many units are you going to sell? And uh, how much are you going to make per units? And what they really care about is profit, profit, profits. Whereas I was coming from a different perspective of how can we best help people. So it almost didn't feel right to charge people a lot of money. Um, but what ends up happening, and you'll see this again and again as you start to um, work for the industry, is that it's a very profit-driven place where people really care about like how much money are we making this year and how much money can we make next year. So it becomes um, a, a place I kind of don't like as much, to be honest, but it, it, the world runs on money and, and that's what it runs on. So how do we help people but at the same time survive as a company is really a challenging question, especially when it comes to the disability population you're looking at not a huge number of people. And if you look at pharmaceutical companies, what they do is they're like, okay, only like 10 people in the world have this illness and we de develop this drug. We're not gonna make much money out of it. The manufacturing cost is gonna be more than the profit we make. So they end up charging people ridiculous amount of money per person. If you ever look at the news, sometimes you'll hear complaints from people going like, I can't afford my drugs anymore. Why? Because pharmaceuticals want to make money. And if they're going to be losing money by selling you drugs, why are they here if they're going to be losing money? So it becomes a real challenge. And there are a number of ways around it um, that requires a lot of creativity and a lot of hard work. Um, I'll briefly share one of the ways. Um, so my friend uh, who created a watch that you can touch in order to tell time, basically has like two little magnets and um, like each magnet has a little ball on it. And basically like when when the hour clock and the minute clock goes around, the little ball 
um, it's stuck to like the magnet underneath. So it also rotates around. So all you have to do is feel the two little like spherical balls on the watch to know what time it is. Brilliant idea. Anyway, um, so the way that he went about uh, making sure the company can survive is by marketing this to people who are not blind at the same time. So imagine if you're talking to someone and they just keep on yapping on and on and on, and you're like, okay, I really got to go to my next class because I'm almost late, but you don't want to be rude by looking at your watch. What you do is uh, if you have one of those watches, you can just touch the watch and go like, oh, it's almost three o'clock. I really need to go to my next class. And then you have to make some kind of excuse to, you know, um, to, to stop that conversation. But there are a lot of instances like this where the sighted normal population can also benefit from this. And what he did was market to that population. And all of a sudden, boom, he opens it up to more people, more people meaning more money, more money meaning he can actually survive, um, his company can actually survive. So there are ways around it. These are known as adjacent markets, uh, basically changing your product ever so slightly or not changing at all and then just um, selling it to a completely different demographic uh, a bigger demographic in order for your for your uh, company to survive so he did that and that's something that i would highly encourage you guys to also look into if you ever want to go into the startup world with your assistive tech because you're going to run into similar issues i do a lot of times in terms of hey i want to raise funds for my startup and then investors are like no the numbers are too small i'm not going to give you any money unless you go to angel investors um, and some of them might just be like oh i'm going to give the give money out of the goodness of my heart without expecting a profit but those are also very rare people. So in order to really get funded, sometimes you have to be real creative and um, there has to be solutions like that. So that's one thing I really learned. Startups need a lot of money and you really want to know how to be creative in order to make a profit, in order to stay afloat, in order to really help people that you want to help. Also listen to your users because a lot of times they're, they're really right. My first prototype failed miserably. If I were to make 50,000 units of that, that would be a waste of money and waste of time and waste of everything. But my customers told me, hey, that wasn't the right solution. You need to listen to us. And I created a better solution that they really needed. And then your team is everything. If your team is not up to do the work, nothing is gonna get built. And don't be afraid to share your crazy ideas with your team. Sometimes um, a better idea is just around the corner and that can really help your team to grow and help you to uh, create better products. So the startup unfortunately didn't work out, although I do want to return to it in the future with a little more time, money and resources to see if I can try again because it's an idea that it's, it seems the blind community really loves and really want to see happen. Um, but uh, for now, it's uh, it remains in the prototyping stage. That is all. Uh, thank you, guys. So Ojo is the company. Um, Ojo means I in Spanish. And um, when I was originally learning the word, I thought it looked like a pair of eyes with a nose in the middle. So that's the name of the company. And uh, thank you guys for listening. Any questions from you guys? I had a question about the product. So just for clarification, um, with the ring, would the user have the ring on like their finger and then be able to read it as they turn the ring? Um, I was a little confused about that. Yeah, sorry, I didn't explain this very well. So what happens is um, you would usually wear the ring sort of on your finger and like any finger you want to. And once you want to use it, you would take it out um, off, off of your finger, you would put your index finger inside the ring. Um, you would open this little flap here, so it becomes like this. And then you would put, um, say, your middle finger on this just to stabilize this. Um, because what we noticed uh, during testing was that sometimes the ring would not roll in a, a straight line. So it might just roll off your finger as time goes on. So if you have some way for this to stabilize, um, by like um, putting your middle finger here and then putting your 
your uh, index finger into the ring, you can actually uh, keep the uh, get the ring moving uh, on a flat surface, any flat surface, and uh, just keep it going. Um, and the way that it works in terms of uh, like you may notice this is sort of floating in the air um, compared to like this outer shell here. We're thinking of using magnets to keep this inner circle equal distance from the outer circle, but obviously all that still needs to be tested out fully. So the other challenge was that this became an overwhelmingly difficult project in terms of the technical details, in terms of mechanical and electrical um, technical skills that were needed. Um, and that just took way too much development time. So we were halfway through when our funding ran out and we were all students at MIT uh, a few years back and everyone was doing this like during our very limited um, spare time. So it was just really difficult to continue at the time, but it's definitely something I hope to continue in the future. Um, does this answer your question or do you need more elaboration or clarifications? Yeah, and I, I'm assuming that the the I'm sorry I don't know but like the dots on the braille the braille dots would be generated like um or if it's an e-reader did are the dots generated via like Bluetooth or how are they um yeah so um we are thinking of using wireless communication um it, it could be uh, Bluetooth it could just be like um your Wi-Fi uh, that's connecting this device over to um, you know, your phone or something. And then you can just say, hey, I want to play this, uh, you know, this uh, ebook or whatever it is, or I want to read this email. You would just send it over through a click of a button. And then um, you would start, like it would sense where your finger is and that would be the start of the first letter. And then as you roll uh, the ring, um, the letters would change, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. But, yeah, it's still a concept, but thank yeah. you for asking that those uh, clarify uh, clarification questions. Yeah. How old were you when you like first started doing research projects? Like, were you like in graduate school or undergrad? Research projects for like, um, can you clarify? Oh, just like you're like exploring your own ideas and testing your own prototypes and stuff like that. Okay, um, so for this particular project, I was in grad school, um, but before that, I was just like looking around in terms of startups for a long time. Uh, so I started in undergrad to just like um, start working on like startups in general, many, many failed startups back then, but it was like, um, I just wanted to get the experience in terms of what it's like to run a startup. Um, and then once I started, like I worked for a bit after undergrad, before grad school, and while I was working, um, I was fortunate enough that like I had a lot more free time. What you guys will notice once you start working is that all of a sudden you have way more free time than school, like during your school days. So like I actually had way more free time. I was able to explore more um, startup ideas. Like I started out by like looking at environmental issues, how to save the planets and things like that, and then moved on to other issues. And finally, I realized that assistive tech was something I really um, cared a lot about. Um, and it was an area I had more uh, like effective um, sort of like skill sets that can be put to good use compared to a lot of the other areas where like it involved a lot of politics and skills that I just basically didn't have. Um, to like influence the government and whatnot. Whereas like here, I have the engineering skills to actually like build something and do something with this. So. Thank you so much. Yeah. Anyone else? I had a question about like, um, from when you said that you did a lot of like observation for like at like the Perkins School of the Blind, like you mentioned. Yeah. Um, are there any like major lessons that you learned from like, doing those observations or like interacting with the people who would be using your product? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so like when I was talking, when I was like, um, like for example, these ladies here that when I was watching them, a lot of times um, what people don't tell you is like how they read braille, for example, like um, 
what some of them do is actually like they would use two fingers one from so two index fingers one from each hand to read so um like they would start with their right finger on the first letter and then their left left index finger would then also follow and reread the same letter over again so it would actually do some kind of like double checking of okay was that really an a or was it actually a b or something like that so that's something that like I didn't know until I started to really watch them and I saw that like people had different ways of reading so some some people actually read with like three fingers and just like go across and some people would like like they all use like different methods and I didn't expect that because I thought oh you just use your index finger to like run across the way that I would intuitively do so but like it wasn't like that it wasn't until I observed them that I really saw this because it didn't really come up in a conversation so it wasn't until i saw it i was like hey how come you guys are doing this and then they explained it was like error checking and things like that so um this wasn't uh to be honest it wasn't really implemented into the prototype because um some of this observational research came pretty late um but in like future versions of this I was thinking of like a multi ring sort of thing, sort of like brass knuckles or something like that, where you can have like multiple fingers all spin and um, spin the different rings and somehow for all the rings to synchronize in terms of the letters and be able to read um, properly. But yeah, like it, it was tremendously helpful to really know this because I had no idea that they were using multiple fingers because like. I'm not a braille reader myself, I'm not blind. So I just thought, I just assumed without any checking that, oh, they probably just use their index finger, which turned out to be wrong in a lot of cases. Um, I mean, they could just use their index finger, but you know, they actually use multiple fingers, which was very interesting. So that's one piece of observation that I found at least. Um, like there were like tiny nuggets of information here and there as well, but definitely I would say like the more you talk to people, the more you will realize that um, a lot of times like assumptions that you make could be like completely off base, uh, which sounds obvious, like I'm, I'm not blind, so why would I know this, but a lot of times like we just make assumptions for some reason. And it's really worth checking with someone who actually uses the stuff. Um, there was one CEO I was talking to a while ago for another blind related startup. Um, he was saying that he actually had his whole team blindfold themselves for a week. And basically what happened was like, there are a lot of things that they realized about like what it's like to be blind or at least like to a certain extent um, that they would not have known had they not gone through that experience. I, I have never tried it, but when I was over at Perkins School for the Blind, they actually had me run around um, blindfolded around in like the circle and the circle like you with my eyes open, I can see very clearly there, there are no obstacles in front of me and it's like just like open fields um, and I won't get hurt, but as soon as I'm blindfolded, I, I just can't run like I have to have my hands out um, in front of me I'm like oh my goodness I'm, I'm gonna trip I'm gonna fall I'm gonna bump into something and it's gonna end up bad, like badly like I just could not run because it was just so terrifying um, so I would highly advise you to like really try to experience what some of these people experience because it would definitely help you to understand them better Anything else? So I had another question. Um, sure. Since most of us are students and some of us are going to college, what advice would you give to us who are trying to find like their way around what they want to study or um, feel like they're interested in something but don't know where to start? Yeah, um, I would say follow your passion. Um, make sure that you dip your toes in the water at least once. Uh, I don't know how, but like um, at least try it. So I'm working with a lot of grad students right now. And uh, recently, like a lot of them have to submit something kind of autobiographical paper where they have to talk about their life and what led them to the point they are right now. And some of them have worked in the industry for a number of years before coming back to grad school. And 
I'm reading all kinds of interesting stories and some of them have said, oh, you know, I started out wanting to be a dentist or I started out wanting to be this or that. And then after completing four years of undergrad, spending all my tuition money and all that, I realized that wasn't what I wanted at all. And um, I had to change field. And I wish I had known this back in high school. So my advice to you guys is somehow try out the field. It could be like take your kids to, to work day kind of thing where you like actually get to sit in a dentist's office and sort of see what they're doing. Um, it could be like talking to someone who is in that occupation that you're interested in just to see what that's actually like. Because what I found after I graduated from undergrad and I had like a ton of friends from like different disciplines was that a lot of them were like, man, I, I thought I wanted this, but it turned out to be not what I wanted at all. Like this job sucks, I hate it. I didn't know it was gonna be like this. Um, so really make sure that you try it out because like what sounds cool on paper may not actually be what you want in like in practice. So really like dip your toes in if you can. Um, and uh, if you find something you're passionate, like also just like go and explore because sometimes like you might, you might find that there are occupations out there that you didn't expect to like, but you try it out and you're like, this is actually really, really cool. And some of the students that I've um, like, I'm reading through their papers, they're like, I came across this by chance. I was with a friend and they dragged me into this event one day and I loved it. And that became my my the like my occupation. Like I made a huge career transition because of that. So try out different things. You know, um, there's a book um, called How to Design Your Life by Bill Burnett. That's really good. It basically talks about how you should really like look at different occupations and really like if there's something you're really interested in, try it out. And see if see if you actually like it or if you just like it in theory and that can really help like it could save you four years and you know I don't know how much money of tuition um if uh it, you know like if you knew ahead of time that this wasn't actually what you wanted but on the other hand it may also confirm you know what you're passionate about is actually the right choice to to make um, the other piece of advice I would say is um, there are a lot of skill sets out there that you can learn on the internet nowadays. Anyone can learn to program, for example. You don't need four years of undergrad to learn how to program. There are a lot of skill sets out there that are like that. But there are also skill sets where I would say you need that solid four-year foundation to really know your stuff. So engineering is one of them where you can't just learn it from Wikipedia. Um, you actually need that from, from like four years of solid education. So try to prioritize this kind of learning if you're going to anticipate that you're going to use these skill sets later on in your career, um, because some skills are learnable and you can just download something from the internet, practice for a few days and you're good to go. There are coding academies now all over the place. You can learn how to code in 30 days and get a job um, coding. You don't need four years of, I don't know how much money in order to code, but um, you know there are other skills that aren't like that. If you wanna go into medical school, for example, you can't just replace that with Wikipedia knowledge and say, hey, here's my Wikipedia knowledge. Will you accept me sort of thing? So, so prioritize things that, um, prioritize things like that. Yeah, thanks. I had a follow-up question too. So um, obviously you have a lot of experience with learning stuff like languages and uh, whatnot. So what would, how would you advise someone who is thinking about knowing, like approaching, like learning something they've never tackled before, but um, don't know where to start or feel intimidated? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So I'll tell you the way I approach it. Um, so usually if something interests me, I just jump right in and I dip my toes in and I go like, okay, um, what can I do with this? Or like, how do I get started with like something simple? Um, start, excuse me, start easy and then see if you really like it. And if you want to pursue it further, come up with some kind of plan of, okay, I'm going to try it out for a week. 
And if it's something I'm re really interested in, I'm going to make a plan of um, how to get to the next level and next level. And I find that what really helps is small wins. So if you say to yourself, um, you know, I, I'm going to reach this level by um, X number of days later or this level by like three months later um, and really celebrate each time you reach that level, like it really helps to build up this um, what's known as like dopamine in your brain or like reward system in your brain where your brain's like, oh yeah, you know, you've achieved this and it makes you feel really good. Um, and you want to achieve more and more and more. Um, and don't be afraid of making mistakes, tons and tons of mistakes. Um, you know, I've made a ton of mistakes in my life. And um, um, I mean, I've, I've, I was reading through a lot of students' papers and a lot of them actually didn't get into MIT the first time they applied. And so they just said, okay, I'm just going to try again and again until they got in sort of thing. So don't be afraid of making mistakes. Um, I was talking to a lab mate the other day for the neuroscience lab I was working in, and uh, he was talking about how he wasted the first year of his research um, because he was basically trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. And I was like, oh man, that, that sucks, right? Like you just wasted a year of um, your graduate school life uh, towards your PhD. Um, and uh, like I heard similar stories from other friends who basically wasted two years of their PhD because they were trying to solve a problem that they really shouldn't have been trying to solve. And what ended up happening was, um, and he said something that was really interesting. He said, uh, for people, so I mean, this happens a lot for your PhD. Um, people spend like a year or two on just like wasted effort compared to there are some people where like everything just works for them and it's like smooth sailing. And what, what they found was that people who had smooth sailing uh, PhDs end up worse in life than people who um, had like these kinds of failures in life where like they wasted like two years of their PhD basically, which seems like a pretty long time, but that makes them better scientists in the end um, because they figure it out um, from their failures, like what to do better. And it actually shows up dr dramatically after they uh, finish their PhD, they go on to something kind of postdoc. And then after that, like professorship, they actually end up with way more successful um, careers in the end because they had such like setbacks and failures in life. So what I'm trying to say is like, don't be afraid to fail um, when you're trying out something new, that's expected. Everyone sucks as a beginner, but if you can conquer that and really just go on, um, you can really achieve amazing results. So I don't, I'm not sure if anybody else has any questions. But... Uh, I have a question on like, I guess like, have you dealt with like burnout? And like, if you have, like, how do you usually like deal with it? Yeah, uh, great question, Grace. Um, so I think burnout is, um, it, it's pretty real for uh, pretty much everyone I've talked to um, and including myself, like I don't have the best way to deal with it, to be honest. Like I tend to just like push through and go like, oh, the finish line is so close. Um, I'm gonna get there soon. Um, but from what I've been told for people who experience burnout, like you have to have a good support system. Like that's the one thing that you really need, um, whether it's like your family, your friends. And once you go off to college, you may notice that like your support system is gonna have to change um, because like your family might be 3000 miles away, like depending on where you go to college and stuff like that. So like one of the first things I would do once you get to college is like try to find a good support group like people that you can really rely on because you're going to go through challenging times. There's no doubt about that. Like when exams come, when like the first time you get that bad grade or whatever it is like, or, you know, like could be like relationship problems or anything else. Like you have to have that support system in place. Um, and also like make sure you're taking care of your health, um, you know, like eating and sleeping properly and things like that. I'm terrible at that. So I shouldn't be, you know, tell, I shouldn't be the one to talk, but um, like that, that's definitely something that, especially once you get to college and your parents aren't there to really like 
take care of you much anymore. You have to take care of yourself. There's like the famous like college, like there's that famous saying that in college you gain five pounds or like 50 pounds. I think it's five, five pounds within your like first semester or something like that. Um, and like, it's pretty true for a lot of people. Um, so just like make sure that you're eating healthy and properly and things like that and, and getting to sleep at a proper time because um, you're actually more productive when you're well rested. This is something I, should, I need to, you know, do better as well. But like when you're tired, your productivity actually goes down. So um, that, that, that's all I can say about that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I guess like along those lines, you have like a favorite. I, I saw your like blog like a long time ago or when Hosea showed us your page. Like there was one on like how to stop procrastinating and be more productive. <laughs> and I really liked it. So I guess like, do you have like a favorite tip from that? Yeah, um, so I actually recently, um, I came across something that was even more intriguing. So I'll share that instead. Um, what some people are starting to do is something called a micro goal. And I think this is helpful in a number of ways. One is, so I'll, let me explain what a micro goal is. Uh, a micro goal is something that's so easy to do that anyone can do. Um, every day so let's say you want to start exercising more regularly it could be that okay i'm, I'm gonna make sure i do one push-up per day um and that takes like i don't know a few seconds to do so i'm only gonna do one push-up per day kind of thing so you're gonna be like oh that's pretty easy so that that becomes something that you start doing regularly and what you will find or at least like people who tried this found was that every single time they do that one push-up, they don't just stop at one push-up. They actually do two, three, four, all the way to like 10, 20, 30, 40, um, depending on like how physically fit you are, obviously. Um, or like if you want to learn a language and you say, I'm, I'm only going to memorize one word per day. That seems like a pretty easy goal to do, right? But what ends up happening is that like people end up actually memorizing like 10 words per day instead of one, because once they get started on one, why not do two? Why not do three? Like once you get into that momentum, you want to do more. Um, so like micro goals have been extremely successful for a lot of people, it seems where like once you get started, you start to actually form good habits. Like the reason why you, you don't wanna work out for like half an hour each day is because, oh, you gotta get dressed, you gotta go down to the gym and then you gotta sweat and you gotta like, it just becomes like a real hassle. And like, sometimes you're like, oh, I don't wanna spend half an hour on this today. Well, spend five minutes on it. Don't spend half an hour, spend five minutes on it. That seems easy to do, right? Like you can spare five minutes, so if you don't have time, just do five minutes today, do five minutes tomorrow. But sooner or later, what becomes a habit is, you know, not just five minutes per day, but rather, oh, hey, I really want to go to the gym. I really want to work, work out. I'm seeing results and this actually looks good. And this also applies to your work in the sense of, um, let's say you're writing let's say you're reading through your textbook and it's just like really long, really boring, really tedious. And you're like, oh man, I still got like, what, like 40 pages more to go and the exam is in two days and I hate this, right? Um, what you can actually do is just convince yourself, all right, I'm just gonna do five more minutes of reading. No more, just five more minutes. And you're like, yeah, I guess I can do five more minutes. I've been studying for, for a few hours now. I guess I can do five more minutes. And so you, you continue reading. And what you will realize is that you don't just do five, five more minutes, but you go on for another half an hour and all of a sudden, you know, you got more work done. Um, so there are, you know, mind tricks, so to speak, that you can, where you can actually push yourself to do more. Um, a friend of mine recently said that when he does push-ups, he doesn't actually count. He gets someone else to count for him. And what he realizes is that usually he would stop at say 40 push-ups because his mind gets to 40 and goes like, okay, I'm tired. 
And if he gets someone else's accounts, he can actually do way more than 40 push-ups because um, he's not keeping track and his brain is not saying, I'm tired by the time he gets to 40. So as a result, he pushes through and actually does more. So a lot of times what I find is that our, our minds actually set limits as to you know like things that we do and how, how much we should do. Um, but you can actually try to remove these limits yourself and actually do more. Um, so that's just one, one piece of advice I would have on motivation and how to not procrastinate as much. Thank you. Yeah. So I think that's all the time we have. Um, um, Jen, I don't know if you're comfortable with this, but would you mind sharing your email in case anybody else? Absolutely. Um, I think I had this at the beginning of the slide deck. Yep. Oh, and it's cut off. Um, can you guys see this? Mm -hmm. So jenwu at mit.edu is my email. And feel free to reach out through any other means. Um, I can share my, so I'm not always the best at, um, you know, responding right away. So I apologize if I, um, you know, ever, you know, get back to you late, but I'm going to share these two. And also I'm on social media as well. And sometimes that'll get you a faster response, but yeah, and WhatsApp and things like that. So definitely feel free to reach out through any means um, necessary. Um, and uh, yeah, happy to, you know, chat at any time, like what school you want to get into, like what field you want to do, or like assistive tech related things, or just you know, if you want to just chat in general, you know, definitely feel free to reach out and uh, yeah, happy to talk to you guys. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jen, and thank you guys for coming. Um, this is our last speaker event for this year, which is like, we only have like 17 days left of the year, but um, but thank you guys so much for joining and yeah, catch you guys later. Yeah, thank you guys. Yeah. Happy holidays. Happy holidays.